No. We said the function of the heart is the cardiac output, the pumping of the blood. This cardiac output is made up of two components, the stroke volume and the heart rate. The stroke volume depends upon the preload, the amount of blood in the left ventricular cavity. If you don't have any blood, it won't push. And the afterload, the blood, uh, the left ventricle is ejecting uh, its content against because of the resistance in the outlet vessel, in the, uh, in the vessel in the outer pulmonary artery. And the force of contraction, which is called the contractility or the inherent ability of the muscle to contract. The heart rate depends upon the, how much sympathetic activity you have and the parasympathetic activity, the sympathetic will increase as you run or you get excited or upset, your heart rate goes up because the blood pressure, the uh, cardiac output demand is there, increase in demand. So therefore, the myocardial performance, again, to put it in the graphic way, is depends upon the preload, the afterload, the contractility, and the heart rate. The same thing, we're putting it in words in a, in a form of a, almost a plus sign there. Now, what are the determinants? What determines how much preload you're going to have in the ventricle? First of all, intrathoracic pressure. The more negative it is, the more venous return, the more blood would come back to the ventricle, the more preload. Then atrial contribution. When atrial contracts the last minute, as you saw in the, in the graph, they're there, it will give you more uh, blood, the last squeeze of blood from the atrium into the ventricle, so that will uh, affect the preload. The total blood volume, of course. Go to the butcher, butcher shop, pick up the heart, it's still contracting in a recently killed animal. You won't see blood, you won't see cardiac output. As simple as that. Or I always give the example of an automobile. You don't have a per, uh, petrol or gasoline, the car won't run, no matter if you have a Porsche or a, or a, any other uh, fancy car there. Muscular exercise, because that increases the venous return. That's why the muscular exercise is important. Interpericardial pressure. If it is too high, it will become a barrier to the ventricular dilatation and the preload would decrease, such as in uh, constrictive pericarditis, a pericardial effusion. Venous tone. If the, there's a problem, serious problem, some people have varicosity or another venous tone, blood is not coming back. It is stagnating down in the periphery. And finally, the body position. Your standing decreases cardiac output. Some gravity is playing the role. Your supine, that's why you raise the leg to some time to increase the venous return, especially in case of the mitral stenosis, you want to increase the venous return. What about the determinants of afterload? What determines that you have as much resistance to the ventricular contraction? On the negative side, in blue, if you give any medication, vasodilate, or you have an acidosis because of anoxia, the peripheral vasodilation would occur. If you have intra-aortic balloon, sometimes we put it in a case where you need to increase the diastolic pressure to put the blood back into the system so the coronary arteries can be perfused, but at that time, the systole, the balloon get deflated, and you have acting as a vasodilator. On the positive side, which increase the impedance to the uh, outflow resistance, such as catecholamine, especially norepinephrine, which constricts the blood vessels. Non-valvular or valvular aortic stenosis, obviously, the ventricle is contracting against mechanical obstruction. You have increased blood volume, or you have renin angiotensin system, because they will constrict the vessels. Eldostron, angiotensin, one angiotensin, two. So these are the determinants of the afterload. Oh, I went back. So what about the myocardial contractility, the third component of the heart function that we were talking about? On the negative side, you have a heart muscle disease called cardiomyopathy. Cardio heart, myo means muscle, pathy means pathology. So you have some disease which is limited to the heart muscle that it doesn't contract. You have a myocardial infarction because the blood, blood decrease, vessel occluded, blood decrease, the muscle losses blood supply and infarcted. You have a pharmacologic depressant, such as beta blocker, which decreases the muscle contraction, some calcium blocker, especially like a verapamil, which decreases the contraction. You have anoxia, hypercapnia, acidosis, all these things would decrease the contractility, inherent ability of the muscle to contract. On the positive side, to improve the contractility, you have given digoxin. You have given other inotropic agents, such as dopa, dopamine, dobutamine, amrinone, epinephrine, all these four are classical, called positive inotropic agent, which increase the contractility of the heart muscle. And you have, you talk about the sympathetic nerve impulses. All these increase the contractility to improve the function of the heart. So therefore, putting all together what we're saying, that the factors which contribute to the heart failure are either increased afterload, 
increase preload, it's like an India rubber. You stretch it, it will shorten, but you stretch it too much, it will break. Same thing, if you increase the preload a little bit, you may have a better cardiac output. But if you too much preload, it may decrease, uh, uh, like India rubber, it may stretch failure, decrease contractility. Now what happened very interestingly, once the failure sets in, this causes more preload. Further, because the heart is not contracting, whatever the blood is there, is there, now becomes more. Same thing after load, because if body tries to raise the blood pressure by releasing ultrasound, by releasing angiotensin, after load increases. Because of further load, you become a more decreased contractility. So it becomes a vicious circle, no matter where you started with. But this is crucial for understanding as well as for treatment purposes, which was the initiating factor, which was the one which started the whole vicious cycle. So this, this is the reason now we know, we want to know what are the causes of increased preload. Valvular regurgitation, mitral and aortic regurgitation, blood comes back. Initially, the heart dilates to overcome it, but cannot dilate further, so heart would fail. Ventricular atrial septal defect, again, increasing the too much blood volume. Patent ductus arterio is the same thing. Arterium is shunt. So all these things which increase the blood volume in the, volume in the heart, the preload, may then lead to more stretching and more damage and more heart failure. What about increase after load? The three classical things are hypertension, aortic stenosis, valvular, subvalvular, and coarctation. All these three things will raise the pressure in the, in the aorta beyond the aortic valve, and ventricle will have to contract against them. What about the dec dec cause of decreased contractility? Regional means coronary artery disease, will our supply was decreased in that particular area or global, such as the heart muscle disease, cardiomyopathy, viral, or diabetic, or whatever. Maybe the reason primary or secondary, there are many, many causes of cardiomyopathy. But at least to understand the, uh, have the basic mechanism, we can see these are the three basic parameters which get affected, and these are the major diseases which affect. So therefore, now let's put it together, all together, in terms of pathophysiology, the heart failure. We said what happened? At this point, let's say there was a too much systolic stress from the increased heart load from hypertension. What the heart did, increase the hypertrophy, increase the muscle heart, like you build up your muscle bar to uh, pick up the weight. The heart failure set in, which caused the preload, which caused the load, which decreased the contractility. And this failure also, uh, on the other side, retained the sodium retention, and also increased catecholamine, not epinephrine. Now this becomes a vicious circle. If you started out with cardiomyopathy, same thing happened. If you started out with diastolic stress, such as regurgitation, either regurgitation, first the left ventricle would enlarge, but later on would do the same thing. So there is a tremendous interplay between all these three basic parameters, but you need to know which one was the main culprit, which the other two are. Now, the next question, as I showed you in my outline, now we want to know how to, at that time, put all together and assess it. Now, here is a beautiful example here. What happened? And diastolic pressure we are taking as a parameter of heart failure. As the pressure rises at the end diastole, which I showed you in the first graph, where the inlet valves are closed, and if the pressure rises initially, patient may complain of um, dyspnea or shortness of breath. We know cardiac, um, that means the cardiac failure right now. We know right now, this is the normal. See, as the pressure rises, the ventricular performance at the uh, the left ventricle and diastolic pressure, the preload rises, the uh, ventricular performance keep on increasing to a, to a certain point. Once you have already some problem, let's say preload or afterload or contractility, initially fine, they don't have any symptom, but as these, uh, 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 what you call the preload increases, you have the curve which tries to overcome, but later on in patient with heart failure, it doesn't rise at all and you will see all the symptoms of heart failure, I mean, namely edema or pulmonary edema or whatever. Another way of looking against the afterload, therefore the, against the preload, the same thing. Now we look at the cardiac output. As the outflow resistance increases, in the normal, it stays the same, but then it drops. It's just like a normal person getting tired when you climb up the hill. While you're walking on the flat surface, you're fine. When you climb the hill, you get tired. Same thing, the heart is working against the increase after load, let's say hypertension, but later on the time would come, even the normal heart is started depressing the function. If those people who have a heart failure already, if you increase the afterload because the catecholamine, not epinephrine being released, or aldosterone or angiotensin, 
heart failure would make it worse, and same thing, severe heart failure. So now it's telling you the importance, not only what you started with, but it adding on, it is like an insult to injury. So con uh, continuing with the pathophysiology of heart failure, we say there's the myocardial damage, you have a left ventricular dysfunction, this caused the decreased cardiac output, this caused the increased endostolic volume, and you develop the symptoms. This will then lead to organ per perfusion problem, some neurohumoral activation, such as uh, renin angiotensin system and uh, what you call anti vasopressin and so forth, ANP. These will then cause increased systemic vascular resistance, afterload would increase ventricular fling pressure would increase and make worse left ventricular function. And this also may then affect the kidney, the muscle, the brain, the liver, every done started dysfunction.